we are about to launch into It's Up to You 2024. And for the sake of those who might be guests, um, let me explain that this is a series that will take up the bulk of the summer, and it is comprised entirely of questions or topics that were suggested by our congregation. Now, there's an entire list, by the way, of the questions or topics we're going to cover, both in the bulletin and on the big bulletin board by the offices. And there are some doozies in there this year. You never disappoint. Perhaps you'll reflect with me that a series like this you could label as a high-risk, high-reward kind of series. The risk is obvious. We're going to get into questions about which all of us do not agree. And sometimes in churches, when we do not agree, it goes catastrophically wrong. And some of us may have experienced that in our church past. The high reward is we get to show ourselves and our deeply divided, polarized country that unity is possible between people who don't agree. That we value something more than our disagreements. And that really is, deep down, the intent or purpose of a series like this. But I typically like to start the series with a message that sets the table for it or frames the series, and I'll do that again today. And today I want to do that by talking about tradition. Now, biblically speaking, tradition sometimes is a good thing. The Apostle Paul, three times in his letters, uh, the disciple John in his first letter in chapter 1, both describe their ministry as simply passing on to others the tradition that was given to them. So they received something from Jesus or other Christians, and they then are passing that baton on to others. There's a Presbyterian pastor at Second Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis named Louis Galloway who describes this positive point of view on tradition in Scripture this way, quote, We all live by tradition. Our traditions can represent the wisdom of prior generations. Traditions structure and guide us. They express the common values of a community and they give shape and form to our deeply held beliefs, end quote. Well, today we're going to talk about Jesus' cautions or warnings about tradition as a way of leading into this series of sometimes difficult, disagreeable questions. And to do that, we're going to look at the beginning story in Matthew chapter 15. This is not a unique story. It is also told in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, but also events like you're about to read or hear, they've already happened twice in the Gospel of Matthew. Something like this has already happened in Matthew 9, and something like this has already happened in Matthew 12. In the the email that goes out tomorrow, you'll get a chance to read those passages if you want. So let's begin. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Then the Pharisees and scribes, okay, pause, who are those people? Those are the religious leaders and experts in Jesus' day. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. So what do they mean by the traditions of the elders? Um, Well, for starters, sounds like those traditions are old, right? They're from elders, duh. Okay, yeah, they're not. The Pharisees as a faction 
when Jesus is alive and active and doing his public ministry are less than 100 years old. The Pharisees as a faction, in fact, are somewhere between 50 and 70 years old. Many of these traditions of the elders that will be at odds in this passage are still under debate and discussion. So it is a bit of a fallacy that these traditions are old. By the way, you may reflect on some of your own traditions or other traditions and see the same kind of thing. People will say, well, we've always thought this, or we've always been this way, and then you dig into it and you find out, no, actually, that's not true. But really what's at issue here is that there were moral and religious traditions that were deeply valued, closely held, that, as Ben Witherington III says, a New Testament scholar, had become as important to these religious leaders as Scripture itself. And specifically at issue is the washing of hands. In the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 30, verses 19 to 21, priests are told that when you enter the tabernacle, you have to wash your hands clean. And the Jewish religious leaders, specifically the Pharisees of Jesus' day, thought Well, if it's good enough for priests, then it's good enough for everybody. And so we think everybody should be diligent to wash their hands every time before they eat so they don't become spiritually unclean. There is somewhere in there, by the way, a noble motive. I hope you hear that. It's kind of egalitarian. What's good for the priests should be good for all of us. Then Jesus begins to reply to this critique of his disciples and his leadership of those disciples. Jesus answered them, And why do you, religious leaders, break the commands of God for the sake of your traditions? Just as a reader of the Bible, when you read through the Gospels, anytime Jesus gets challenged by the religious leaders, It's not going to turn out well for them. (laughs) And then Jesus gives a specific example. For God said, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if a person tells their father or mother, whatever support you might have had from me, I have given to God, then that person need not honor their father. I don't want to get into it today because we're talking about tradition, but the example that Jesus uses here is people who would dedicate or devote all of their money and all of their possessions to God as a way to not care for their aging family and parents. Kind of a loophole, right? They had an accountant in the Cayman Islands. They came up with this. (laughs) But do note Jesus' first critique his first sentence as a rebuttal to these traditions of the elders that had built up and were cherished and deeply valued. Sometimes our traditions cause us to break the very commandments of God. Continuing. So, for the sake of your traditions, you nullify the word of God. Powerful word, that word nullify in ancient Greek. It means to cancel out, to render ineffectual, to drain the power from. That's a nice visual. That sticks with you. That sometimes, Jesus says, our traditions drain the power from God's truth in our life. You hypocrites, a favorite word of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, he uses it 13 times about the religious leaders. In Mark, only once. In Luke, only three times. You hypocrites. And then he cites the prophet Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 13, about what's so wrong in their approach to the traditions of the elders and how it has made them Render God's word void. He says, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Again, Ben Witherington III, one of America's great New Testament scholars of the day, says what Jesus is saying here using the words of the Old Testament prophet is that these religious leaders were practicing an external superficial religion so that they could keep their hearts safe from God. This is what their traditions allowed them to do. So let's review. What are the potential problems with our moral, spiritual, and religious traditions that we may value a great deal, according to Jesus? Well, maybe most fundamentally, we tend to confuse our traditions with the truth. Maybe worse, sometimes those traditions help us run counter of God's truth. Sometimes our traditions steer us toward religious and moral hypocrisy and superficiality. And sometimes it helps us avoid deep heart change. This is why the Apostle Paul will say in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, that sometimes we are taken captive by our own traditions. Now, Let's take what we saw in Matthew 15 and let's think it through for ourselves 2,000 years later about our traditions. Do you know what your moral and religious traditions are? And maybe equally important, do you know where they come from? Uh, some of them for you may come from your family of origin. You had a positive religious or moral experience in your family of origin, and those traits that your family valued, you have then latched onto and carried forward. Good for you. But there's also a group listening to me this morning who is trying to run as far and as fast as they can from the traditions of their family of origin and probably in many cases for good reason. My point being, in both cases, that kind of allegiance to or avoidance of the traditions of your family of origin can make you blind. Maybe it's a person or an experience of influence in your life that has shaped your values. You had this one great church experience in your past, and you have forever been trying to recreate it in every other church you've experienced. That's the power of tradition. Your traditions are also a function of your generation. Do you value sacrificing to get ahead in your career? Do you value loyalty to institutions and leaders? Do you value phone conversations and face-to-face -face dialogue? There's a decent chance you're over the age of 65, <laughs> according to a study published by the University of Purdue. Do you value work-life balance? Do you value the ability to offer constructive criticism to the organization in which you're a part or to its managers and leaders? Do you value immediate, quick communication, like texting? Congratulations, you're probably under the age of 43, <laughs> says the same study from the University of Purdue. My point in citing that, and there are many, many other studies on many other subjects, including some of the most contentious in our culture right now, that would point out that what you think is true and crystal clear is simply a function of when you were born and with whom you associate. Your traditions sometimes are just a reflection of your generation. Your traditions are a reflection of your particular Christian background. One of the things I think that many of us here at Kirkwood value the most is that we are a motley crew. We are a mixed bag of Christians from all across the Christian spectrum. It's a lovely concoction that we get to experience together. 
However, sometimes there's dissonance in that. I've lost count of the number of times someone reaches out to me after a sermon and says, I have never heard that explained that way before. Well, maybe it was a bad sermon. <laughs> or, or maybe our tradition here, which is Reformed, mainline, Presbyterian, PCUSA, is not your tradition. And you thought, going back to a question I was asked last summer, that you should read the book of Revelation in the Bible literally. And then you heard from me, no, actually, historically, that is not the way Christians have read the book of Revelation. And it blew your mind. <laughs> or going back a year and a half, we explored the first couple chapters of the book of Genesis. And then you reach out to me and go, what do you, what do you mean? It's not seven literal days of creation and Christians haven't always understood that way? You're tipping your hand about your particular tribe from which you come from. Sometimes what you think is the truth is simply a reflection of your particular Christian background. That's all. And in our country that is so preoccupied with individualism, we forget that just because I see it this way doesn't mean everybody else does. And then let me mention one more, especially in 2024. Your politics are very likely your traditions, your deeply cherished traditions. And here, I want to cite an article published in the Journal of Politics and Religion by Andre Audette of Monmouth College in Illinois. In this article, he pulls together all the research that's been done recently on the overlap of Christianity and politics in America right now. For example, do you know that 60% of Protestant Christians say they would prefer to go to church only with those who agree with them politically. Do you know that in the same study, it was confirmed that less than a quarter of Protestant Christians currently go to church with people who disagree with them politically? That's staggering to think about. Beginning in 2016, half of all Protestant Christians in this country have thought seriously about leaving their current congregation. And do you know what one of the leading reasons is? Politics. So Andre Audette in his article says, quote, we are starting to see churches that are really formulating their identity around political ideals. That's really harmful. Because it used to be the case that when you'd go to church, you'd sit next to someone who's a Republican or someone who's a Democrat or someone who's an independent. And that's not happening in America anymore. The mix of religion and politics is like American fast food. It tastes good and is terrible for you." End quote. Do you know that your politics are not the truth? They are your tradition. Now, I want to come back to that pastor of Second Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis because he wrote what, hands down, is the best thing that I read in the last couple weeks on the subject of tradition and especially the guardrails we as Christians need to have around our traditions. So I want to pass on four of these guardrails to you as his and my suggestion for us all. Number one, we need to pay attention to see if our traditions have become, his word, mindless. And 
Are they things that no longer connect us to God? There's a famous Austrian composer from the late 19th century and early 20th century named Gustav Mahler. And I want to use his phrasing here. He says that tradition can be either the worship of ashes or the transmission of fire. What's your tradition like? your political tradition, your traditions that you carry from your particular Christian background, your generational traditions. How do they function in your life? Like cold, dead ashes? Or like fire that animates you and animates others? Are your traditions mindless? Have you decided that you're going to stop thinking about whatever that tradition is? And you're just going to accept it forevermore as it is. That then leads in, into his second guardrail for how we should treat these deeply cherished traditions that we mistake for truth. He says that we all need to be able to be critical of our own traditions. When was the last time you let... Jesus and God's truth as revealed in Jesus and the scripture change one of your deeply held traditions. If you can't think of when that happened, you might have a problem. And you might be hanging on too tight to something that is just a tradition, not the truth. Pastor Galloway says, traditions tend to ossify. They become brittle and solid and inflexible. One of the places I've been that um, left a lasting mark on me was the national park in northern Arizona that no one goes to. <laughs> Everyone goes to the Grand Canyon. Very few people go to the Petrified Forest in northeastern Arizona. And scattered around everywhere in the national park are pieces of what once was living wood that has now turned to stone. That's what traditions can be like. They ossify over time. What are your traditions like? Continuing, and if you didn't think that got serious, wait for these last two. Pastor Galloway says, are our traditions merely a projection of our own personal desires? Ouch. <laughs> well, you don't understand. I like a service that is done with the worship that I value. Surely it's better than all the other kinds of worship out there. You are speaking from your tradition. You are not speaking the truth. And frankly, you sound like a consumer. Someone who thinks that I expect of my church what I expect of my waiter at my favorite restaurant. Get the order right, get my food the way I like it, or I am not coming back. Can you see that traditions sometimes just serve our own desires? And then last, do our traditions protect us from real heart change? Pastor Galloway says, you need to realize, don't wag your finger in disgust at the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 15. They aren't the only hypocrites. We are all hypocrites. To be a human being is to be an expert at hypocrisy. We love to live in denial of what's really going on. We use our traditions, our talking points, our bullet points as a diversionary tactic to keep us from noticing what's going on in our own mind, heart, and soul. So how about we all pause and put the guardrail up and say, 
we here are about heart change because that's what Jesus is after. And all of the arguments about traditions we will push to the side and not ever let them rival this chief purpose of transformation in our lives and in the community we share together. So how about as we launch into this series where nothing is taboo and we will eventually talk about everything, we decide together that we are going to safeguard Kirkwood by thinking clearly about tradition and heeding some of Jesus' cautions. This is what it may look like. How about you and I not confuse our own cherished traditions with God's truth? How about you spend time over the next two months critiquing your own traditions and not somebody else's? How about we choose to respect one another in our differences, not only in our similarities? How about you allow yourself to be open to ideas and perspectives that you've never heard before simply because they weren't from your tradition? And how about you trust God to lead each and every person here the same way that you trust God to lead you, even if it looks like he may be leading them differently? We as Presbyterians believe one of my favorite things that is said in the Book of Order, that God alone is the Lord of the conscience. And what about we are dutiful and purposeful to keep Christ at the center and everything else matters less? Are you with me? I hope your answer is yes. Let's pray. Our good God, we confess to you that we live in a country, and yes, even among Christians, who now just divide without thinking. It seems second nature to us. Unity is hard. Maybe that's why it's so easy for us to separate. Use this morning and this powerful story about Jesus and tradition to make us mindful of what is truth and what is not and to help us put guardrails around our own traditions. Lord, we thank you for Jesus and how he always points us in the right direction. We pray this together. Amen.